again engaged in the heartbreaking process of learning that unless he turns to spiritual things, he suffers another devastating blow from nature's automatic compensating mechanism. For if the material things he creates are not used for the benefit of man, soon they become weapons that are turned against him. They separate, divide, and destroy until he is once more upon his knees begging for some sort of guidance. Unfortunately, it would seem that only circumstances can force man to do what his heart and conscience should have prompted him to do long before. The processes of wealth production, using the tremendous resources at our command, could easily maintain a generous standard of living for all men on the planet. But unfortunately, these processes of wealth production are still mainly looked upon as money-making processes rather than welfare-assuring processes. We are still more interested in the profit than in the patient. The limited and jealously guarded allegiances to different flags, complexions, and prayers have kept man from attaining a united, cooperative, organic whole. In a family unit where love is the ruling factor, we make whatever sacrifices are necessary to maintain the unity and welfare of the group. But the human family created by one God, living in one home, the planet, is sadly lacking in a universal love that can bind it together. It is crying for a world conscience that can become the basis of cooperative living. It is the hope of the Baha'i world faith that all religions will at last link together their efforts in establishing this world conscience based upon the universal truths that are common to all their beliefs. Mankind has allowed historic accidents to divide it, accidents of national boundaries, of skin colors, of political theories, of religious beliefs. These differences, which should be factors of pleasing variety, have become weapons of separation. These so-called differences can play a vital part in the growth of society. They have validity and truth as long as they are recognized as relative and temporary stages of man's development. However, we have allowed them to crystallize into truths of permanent value. Until now, they have become barriers across which the concepts of world unity find difficulty in flowing. It is an unfortunate fact that the liberals of one age become the orthodox of the next. We gain our destination, our goal, and then we turn a well-directed cannon upon those who would come after us and go yet further. Scientifically, technically, we are a united world, an adult world. Emotionally, spiritually, we are an immature world, fighting over our dolls and our cherished inheritances. What an unhappy sight that there should be universal acceptance of those material scientific things that can dismember us, and no universal acceptance or recognition of the one thing that could preserve and unify us, love. It is just such a love that is missing from our united international undertakings today, a universal love. Not a vague and pious thing, but a wholesome, practical, down-to-earth realization that the world is one country and mankind its citizens. An insistence upon the obvious truth that there is no exclusive salvation for the Frenchman, the American, the Spaniard, nor any exclusive salvation for the Jew, the Christian, the Mohammedan, or the Baha'i. Any plan that is less than planetary in its scope is doomed to failure. The words of John Donne are truer today than ever. Do not send to ask for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for you. There is a new spirit abroad in the world that is booming out a requiem to those atrophied ideas which look only upon the advantages of the individual and which stunt and thwart the advantages of the community of man. It sounds a death knell to a society which we are told can spend three and a half million dollars more for liquor, two and a half million dollars more for cosmetics in one year than it can spend for education. It tolls out the last rights to an age that can deliver streamlined cars in abundance when housing is at a premium, that can live affluent in wines and liquors when large portions of the population are impoverished for milk. The world toward which man is striving is one in which there will be both streamlined cars and ample housing. A world where there will be a harmonization between capital and labor to the advantage of both. A world with more money for books and microscopes. A world where the extremes of wealth and poverty will be abolished. Yet a world where there will always be varying degrees of success based upon talent and initiative. Above all, a world in which a man can enjoy all the fine things of life. Extracting all the throbbing wonder, adventure and joy out of living 
because of one thing. Why? Because he has not allowed material advantage and individual gain to come between him and his responsibility to his fellow man and to his God. Such a world could be a reality today if a man desired it. He has only to put into effect the law of love. This means a return to a wholehearted belief in God. This is the purpose of true religion. This is the challenge to all faiths, that they rekindle their lost fire. Baha'u'llah, founder of the Baha'i world faith, has said, the corrosion of ungodliness is eating into the vitals of a despairing society, and nothing but a fresh outpouring of its healing power can ever revive it. No one loves us, really. Our wives, husbands, or children, our parents, no one. They love the qualities that we possess, the kindness, the justice, the generosity. These are the things they love. And as we add these qualities to our lives, their love for us increases. And if we lose them, their love withers and falls away. And what is true of individuals is also true of nations. Unless a man reflects a love for all mankind in his heart, unless a nation pledges itself to the protection and welfare of all society, then neither can command the respect, devotion, or allegiance of those they might hope to lead. When Baha'u'llah wrote, This handful of dust, the earth is one home, let it be in unity. He counseled that a man's glory should not lie in this that he loves his country alone, but rather in this that he loves his kind. These qualities which attract others to us and qualify an individual or nation for leadership can only be instilled in men's hearts by the law of love. This is not a foggy, ambiguous thing, this law of love. It is the only unifying force in the world. It holds the planets in their orbits, gives them order and harmony, holds our bodies together. In this form, we call the law of love, atomic attraction, or affinity. All creation operates by this law. It is the same law of love, affection for a common ideal that built our great nation, that built yours and the rest about the world. It holds clubs together, societies, nations, religions. Jesus said, This is my commandment unto you, that ye love one another, even as I love you. When this love begins to wane, in whatever field it may be operating, it brings about the dissolution and death of the organism, whether it is the mineral, the animal, or the human kingdom, whether it is physical, social, or moral. When the law of love, atomic affinity, or common aspiration begins to lose its vitality, the organism disintegrates and dies. It is this law of love that is missing from the life of society today. The law of love shines constantly from the words of Christ. Baha'u'llah, founder of the Baha'i world faith, has again breathed into the world this law of love. It lives throughout the more than 100 volumes which he wrote. He has written, Know thou that in every age all divine ordinances are changed and transformed according to the requirement of the time, except the law of love which, like a fountain, always flows and is never overtaken by change. What is it that has enforced these laws as given by the world educators, such as a Moses, a Jesus, a Buddha, a Muhammad, or a Baha'u'llah? What has made it possible for a civilization to rise upon their teachings? Without question, it was the belief of the Hebrews that the Mosaic Code had a divine origin, that it was not man-made. This was the source of its vitality. Thus saith the Lord, was the authority. In Jesus' time it was, This is not from me, but from my Father which is in heaven. Another way of saying, Thus saith the Lord. Baha'u'llah has in like manner emphasized that if spiritual truth hopes to exercise any abiding influence upon the affairs of men, it must have an authority to which men can lay down their lesser allegiances of the superiority of race, class, or country to a world allegiance. No force, says Baha'u'llah, no power, can restore and stabilize the world's prosperity today, but the awakening of man to a sense of the oneness of all the world in all of its social relationships. This means that he must eliminate all his prejudices of skin, flag, and prayer. And this can be brought about, Baha'u'llah tells us, by no other agency than a return to a belief in God. It must be a God far beyond the limited concepts of an unthinking world. Not a God who commands, who points a finger, and who says, do this, do that. But an unknowable God, beyond definition or description. A God infinite, who works through channels called world educators, prophets. A Moses, a Jesus, a Buddha, a Muhammad, a Zoroaster, a Baha'u'llah. Great spiritual leaders who call mankind's attention 
to the laws of God for the age in which he appears. Whether a man obeys or rejects these laws remains his own responsibility. He is not given a peremptory order. He is given an opportunity, and the choice is his. Just as all our knowledge of material things has widened in this age, so has our understanding of spiritual truth. There can be no blind acceptance in such an enlightened age as this. God's greatest gift to mankind, says Baha'u'llah, is his intelligence. Religion and science must go hand in hand, and any religion which is contrary to science is merely superstition. A religious education which is fitted to this age means a belief that there is in reality only one religion and that all the great prophets have taught one and the same thing. It is one law of love flowing through them all. In Moses we see the seed, in Christ the bud, in Muhammad the flower, and in Baha'u'llah the fruit. All are equal, all are valid. They are separate stages in the development of man's understanding of the law of love as applied to the age in which he is living. It is not necessary to lower Jesus to raise Baha'u'llah, nor to lower Moses to raise Jesus, for their missions are one, their teachings inseparable. All have called mankind to the same truth, that lovers of mankind, these are the superior people of whatever country, belief or complexion they may be. Men who have dedicated themselves to the service of society will find Baha'is in over 110 of the major countries of the earth waiting to spring to their assistance. Today, in over 2,500 localities of the world, there are Baha'is of every background, background of race, of faith, of nation, of economic strata, linking their efforts to those who stand for a world united politically, culturally, economically, and educated under a common curriculum. These followers of Baha'u'llah are devoted to the service of a world society, which can be obedient to a world government based upon sound, universal, democratic principles. They labor for a world that is coming to maturity, a world that is dedicated to human progress, in which the law of love has sanction and is vitally active in the lives and social affairs of mankind. May the day soon arrive when a man may devote his life to the full development of the potentialities with which he has been endowed. We ask it in the name of Moses, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Muhammad, in the name of Buddha, in the name of Baha'u'llah, in the name of all the great world educators, since the beginning of time.